Welcome back. All right, I want to talk about Seattle today. I want to talk about Seattle because I think, yeah, it's a good time to talk about them. Uh, the winning streak that they're on is impressive. This season's been impressive. What's interesting to me is that it is not unlike the season that was put together by the Vegas Golden Knights their first year in the National Hockey League. In fact, right now Seattle's on pace for 50 wins. They're on pace for 108 points. Right? So they're right in line with what Vegas did their first year. Now what's interesting is that before their first year, there were some who predicted them to be in the mix for the playoffs. Um, looking at their team, I thought, well, yeah, they, they could in the Pacific be maybe fourth, maybe fifth. Maybe they do end up having a good year and, you know, making it to the playoffs. And analytically, the advanced stats people looked at this team and said, this is actually a really well-drafted good team. Now, they were dunked on for not taking Tarasenko, for not taking Carey Price, various other names that were on the list that people thought were better options. But year two is bearing out that Seattle was right. Now, what's interesting is we went through a really painful year one which meant they got to draft early, and they end up getting Shane Wright, who currently is in this part of the board as being on the way. Uh, one goal and one assist in eight games for Seattle this year, and I'm seeing a lot of, well, he's a bust, and well, he was very good here. And, uh, the hot takes, I, I don't think, are going to age very well. I think with Shane Wright, I think he's going to be a very good two-way center. I don't know that he'll ever be a, a superstar, a 100-point player or anything, but I think he could end up being a guy who scores you about 60 points a year and becomes really good on faceoffs, and is just really responsible at both ends of the ice. So that's that's what I see with Wright anyways. But the interesting thing is they're one of the teams that's going to have some good cap space at the deadline. Currently, according to Cap Friendly, at the, cap, at the trade deadline, their cap space will be $5,141,154. It's pretty precise, so I will trust their calculations. <clears throat> One name that gets floated out there as being available for trade is Bo Horvat. I look at this lineup and I think, you know, they don't need Horvat, but they would probably accept a Bo Horvat. This is a team, though, that doesn't struggle with scoring. And what, what really is impressive is, and I mean, I'm wearing my Jaden Schwartz jersey because why not? The, the fun thing about this team is all four lines can produce. The scary thing is, there are guys on this team that have underproduced and could very well have a stronger second half. So we'll go through this, and again, I, I got the lines through the, the depth charts on Cap Friendly, so I'm not worried about who plays with who. Hackstall's willing to shift the lines around too, so it doesn't really matter, right? Uh, but Jaden Schwartz in 40 games, 10 goals, 13 assists, 23 points. He's on pace for 20 goals. That's not too shabby. It's a good season. I've always been a fan of Schwartz. He usually comes up with big goals when you need him and has proven he's an asset in the playoffs when he's been there in, in previous years. Uh, Alex Wenberg, who was added as a UFA, the same as Jaden Schwartz. So I've got here how the players were added. Uh, Wenberg in 41 games, 8 goals, 11 assists, 19 points. Are those totals great? No, but they don't really need to be. And that's the thing. When you've got four lines that are rolling, one guy struggling or not scoring as much as you'd hoped doesn't drag your team down. So Wenberg and Schwartz are two players that you could say are playing well. Are they having their best years in the NHL? No. And so that's where the scary part comes in. Then you've got Jared McCann, who was uh, acquired in the expansion draft via Toronto. 38 games played, 19 goals, 8 assists, 27 points. He has definitely found his goal-scoring edge as a member of the Seattle Kraken, and I will say he's doing it in a way that I don't think he would have had he not been selected from Toronto. I think if he'd played with the Leafs, his goals would not be 19 this year. Um, maybe more along the lines of 10 or 11. I'm not saying he wouldn't have scored, but at this rate, no. And there are definitely arguments that certain players get chances with brand new teams that they wouldn't get elsewhere. But to me, it doesn't diminish the talent of those players. And people use that to diminish the talent of the players. Uh, Burakovsky, who came in as a UFA last summer, 41 games, 11 goals, 24 assists, 35 points. So he's on pace for 70 points. I think he's been a fantastic forward for them. And then you got Matty Beneers, who was the team's number two pick in 2021, their first ever draft choice. In 41 games, 16 goals, 18 assists, 34 points. So he's on pace for 68 points. He's on pace for the Calder Trophy. If he keeps that up in the second half, absolutely. And I think he already hit the wall and overcame it. He had a period there where he was having trouble with scoring. Uh, recent games, he's overcome that. So maybe he's in for a big second half. Uh, then you got Everly, who was acquired in the expansion draft from the New York Islanders. 41 games, 10 goals, 24 assists for 34 points. So the point scoring is great, but the goals, you know he can score more than that. 
But the remarkable thing with Seattle is you got one, two, three, four, five guys who've already scored 10 plus goals, plus Sprong down here, who is one of those forgotten guys. Uh, so you got Tolvin and who was picked up on waivers. He has hit the ground running with Seattle. 20 games this season, six goals, four assists, 10 points. And he's fit right in. So it was it was an acquire acquisition that they got via waivers. It's not the first time they've hit on waivers either, which was something that Vegas was very good at doing their first year too. They would bring guys in. Ryan Carpenter comes to mind as a guy who came in and with Vegas suddenly he's producing to the point where I had to put a video on who's Ryan Carpenter. So six goals, four assists for Tolvanen. Not bad overall this season. And I don't think that if he'd stayed in Nashville, that would have shown up. It just works in Seattle. They know how this works. And that's where the pro scouting comes in. So we talk a lot about scouting. You have your amateur scouts that go to all the junior buildings and they, they scout in Europe and they scout all over uh, colleges and all the tournaments and, and figure out who the young guys are. Your pro scouts will go to other professional teams and then report back, we like this player's skill set. We think he'd be a good addition. And when I see the way Tolvanen's produced, the way Sprong's produced, that's what I see. Is a team that says, all right, we get these guys that'll fit in. Uh, Yanni Gord who was acquired from Tampa Bay in the expansion draft. 40 games, 6 goals, 21 assists, 27 points. Yanni Gord's only on pace for 12 goals. I think he's going to score more than 12 goals. So again, uh, that's a player that maybe is underproduced from a goals perspective. It's just going to pick up, I think. Uh, then you've got Oliver Bjorkstrand, who was acquired in a trade from Columbus because they picked up Goudreau and they needed to shed some cap. So Seattle said, sure. Now what's interesting with Bjorkstrand is in 41 games, he has 6 goals, 14 assists, 20 points. I don't think he's played great. I think he's been okay. I think I think there's more there. And so I think he's due for more goals in the second half of the season. Yeah, Seattle scoring could be really scary. Uh, Brandon Tanev, who was acquired from Pittsburgh in the expansion draft, 41 games, 8 goals, 13 assists, 21 points. He's been very good. And you look at Tanev, you look at McCann, both of them, of course, Pittsburgh Penguins. Toronto acquired him for expansion draft reasons. But it does show that for Pittsburgh, they definitely lost some depth in that expansion draft. And Tanev has been a leader for this team. Uh, not all leaders wear C's on the front of their jerseys. Tanev goes out there and leads by example. And he is he is tough as nails. He's fearless. It's the reason why when the Canucks had Chris Tanev and Brandon Tanev was available, I'm like, why aren't the Canucks getting this guy? So, because just seeing the name Tanev, I'm like, so he works hard. Get him. Um, Ryan Donato, who was acquired as a UFA, uh, 34 games, 8 goals, 5 assists, 13 points. He's also an unrestricted free agent this coming summer. Uh, I think he's played well enough to justify an extension. I don't know how much that would be worth, but for Seattle, we'll see. And then there's Sprung, who was acquired as a UFA this summer, technically, though he was also, I believe was last year, he was acquired on waivers, right? So in 34 games, 13 goals, 13 assists, 26 points. That's ridiculous. I think that's going to come down a little bit, but that's the thing. Sprung can score a little bit less in the second half because there's some guys on this board here who are due to score more in the second half. He is also a restricted free agent this summer. Uh, if they don't offer him the qualifying offer, of course, that would make him a UFA, but at this point, it's RFA status. And then we get to the blue line. Vince Dunn, acquired from St. Louis in the expansion draft, 41 games, 7 goals, 23 assists for 30 points. Uh, he's a restricted free agent this summer. I would say sign him and sign him quickly. So one thing that's interesting is Matty Beneers is going to be a front runner for the Calder Trophy. Outside of that, I don't know that you can argue a Seattle player for a trophy. You might have one of their forwards here that could fall into sulky consideration, but it's hard to argue that there's a trophy winner in here, which is good. It means that there's no one player. If you're the opposition, you're like, okay, we just shut that guy down and we've got them done. Uh, Beneers is as close as you're going to get, but again, they've got strength down the middle. They've got strength overall. Uh, Dunn has been excellent on the blue line. I'll get him signed. Uh, Adam Larson, who was acquired in the expansion draft from Edmonton and then signed an extension with Seattle. 41 games, 4 goals, 14 assists for 18 points. Larson right now is playing like the guy who New Jersey drafted 4th overall way back when. And, I mean, it took a little while for him to get there, but he's there. And he's on pace for 36 points. So that's absolutely ridiculous. Uh, Alexiak acquired from Dallas in the expansion draft. I was sad when, when they acquired him, but I understood why. And I, I wish him well, 34 games, five goals, five assists, 10 points for the big rig. And he's been, he's been good. He has absolutely been very good for them. As has Justin Schultz, which was a UFA signing I liked a lot last summer. And he's come through quite nicely. 39 games, five goals, 18 assists, 23 points. 
Uh, he is the top in the top two scoring on their blue line. He has just given them a different look, right? He's he's got some good foot speed out there too. He's he's good in transition. I like Schultz quite a bit, and he's got a lot of experience. And I think that was something that was important for for Francis. When you look at some of the additions he made in the offseason, he was adding guys who were good players, weren't over the hill old players, but still had some experience in the NHL, right? Uh, Christian Soucy, who was acquired from Minnesota in the expansion draft uh, for Soucy. is Carson Soucy? Yeah, I said Christian Soucy. Sorry, I confused the goaltender with the forward. And then it throws everybody off because they're like, who in the world is that? Yeah, go look it up. There's there's a goalie. <laughs> anyway, uh, 41 games, two goals, six assists, eight points for Soucy. Uh, he's an unrestricted free agent this summer. So uh, I think he's been a solid defensive defenseman. And then you got Will Borgen, who was acquired from Buffalo in the expansion draft. And I remember Sabres fans saying that they were sad to see him go because they thought he was going to be good. He is good. 41 games, 2 goals, 9 assists, 11 points. He's a restricted free agent this summer. So, yeah, if you're a fan of, uh, of, of the Sabres, you might still be wincing at that one a little bit. Because, yeah, they could use Borgen in their lineup. Then you get to the goaltending. Two UFAs in that. Yep. Uh, starting with Martin Jones, uh, 20 wins for him now in the season, 898 save percentage. Uh, he's a UFA this summer. He's proven he can still play in the NHL. I think his play in Seattle means he's going to get a chance somewhere else or he'll stay in Seattle. And it would be interesting to see what Seattle would think this is worth so far. Like, what do you give him and for how long? Is it a one-year deal? Is it two years? Would he ask for more money? And then how do you work that if you decide, yeah, we need to keep Jones and you've got Drieger and you've got Grubauer. Drieger hasn't played yet. He was acquired in the expansion draft from Florida, has not played yet after signing his three-year, $4.5 million per year deal, played the first year of it last year, this is the second year of the deal, yet to make his debut. There's Giannis Donskoy, who was acquired from Colorado uh, in the expansion draft. He hasn't played this year either, he's a UFA this summer. Coming back to their current goaltending, Philip Grubauer has 14 wins and an 885 save percentage. He was acquired, of course, as a UFA out of Colorado. Grubauer, I'll be interested to see what they do with them because honestly, there might be a solution here where they go with Jones and Drieger and decide to move on from Grubauer. But with the contract at $5.9 million for the cap hit, I'm not sure how that would work. So Ron Francis does have some work to do here because the goaltending, which was an issue last year, has been much better this year. Now, the defense has been far better this year too. Uh, the addition of Schultz has definitely solidified that blue line quite a bit. They are very good at suppressing shots for the opposition. That also shows that your coaching is pretty good there too. Uh, and then in the minors, you've got Hayden, you've got True, you've got Lind, you've got Pagansky, you've got Torinsky, Gustav, Sol Gustav Olison on the blue line, and you've got Decord and Nett. And the reason that I wanted to mention the minors is because for an expansion team, for a newer team, it can be tough in order to have the kind of depth you need for when injuries take place to be able to absorb that. But these players are guys who can step in, play fourth line roles if they need to. They can get called up. They can clear waivers to get sent back down. And honestly, it's not a bad bunch. Like this is this is definitely a team that they've been, they've been fortunate that injuries have been few and far between thus far this season. But if slash when they hit, they do have the depth in, in the minors to deal with it. So let's look at their record. Their first five games this year, they were one, two, and two. It is one of the only five-game segments this year where they've been below NHL 500. Games 6 through 10, they're 3 and 2. Games 11 through 15, they're 4 and 1. Games 16 through 20, they're 4 0 oh, and 1. Game 21 through 25, they're 3 and 2. Then they had a bit of an issue here. Uh, games 26 through 30, they're 2 and 3. Games 31 through 35, they're 2, 2 and 1. And that's where your winning streak gets going. Games 36 through 40, 5 and 0. Oh. And Game 41 played last night. They won in Boston. The only team so far this season to beat Boston in regulation in Boston's building. So right now they're at 25, 12, and 4. They're four points behind Vegas. They have two games in hand on the Golden Knights. They are two points behind LA. They have four games in hand on LA. So they're going to be very busy. Much busier than LA in the second half of the season. That's one thing to keep in mind when your team has games in hand. They've played fewer games. That means they're going to play more games. It's going to be more con more condensed schedule for them than for the opposition. Doesn't necessarily mean they win all of them. But what's interesting is when you look at last year's record at the half, they were 13, 24, and 4. So they have 12 more wins in the first half of the season than they had last year. They're 24 points ahead of last year's pace. 
So 48, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, they go from 60 to 108 if that was the case. And that's an absolutely ridiculous turnaround. That means that Ron Francis could end up being GM of the year. Dave Haxtall could end up being coach of the year. I mean, let's be honest, if Seattle gets anywhere close to first in the division, Haxtall's got to be top three. And so it, it adds this whole idea that, you know, for Seattle, yeah, they had a really rough first season, but they've been pretty darn good in the second. So when we look at their record, too, at home, they have more struggles. They're 10-8-2 and two at home. On the road, they're 15-4-2. and two. So when we're looking at the five-game segments and the ones that are really good, you're looking at a lot of road games in the ones where they're very good. This current road trip has been perfect, and so that's definitely caused the records to be more exaggerated than they were before. Against the Atlantic, they're 7-3. and three. Against the Metro, they're 5-3. and three. So that wipes out the idea that well, you know, they're not very good against the, the really good teams. This is a team that's still kind of middle of the pack, lower. They're just, they're lucky right now. That that gets wiped out quickly. Their road record, the fact they're very good against the East. Against the Central, they're 5-2-2. Two, and two. Against the Pacific, they're 8-4-2. and two. Against Boston, they're 1-0 with the win last night. Then they're going to play the next game in Seattle, which, according to their home record, maybe Boston wins that, right? Uh, against Carolina, they're 0-2, but they're done with the Canes for the season. They have not played Dallas yet, so I've got the four division winners here, division leaders. Uh, but yeah, Dallas, they haven't played yet, so they've got three games against Dallas in the second half of the season. Uh, and against Vegas, they're 1-1 one one so far in the season. So for Seattle, uh, they've been very good against the division leaders. That's a combined record of 2-3 of and three overall, but I mean, the two losses against Carolina, those are forgivable. Uh, and then against Anaheim, so this is where they are against the, the, the teams at the bottoms of the division. Uh, Anaheim, they're 1-0-1. Oh, so they've only won one out of two games. They haven't played. They've, they haven't beaten Chicago. They, they're 0-1 oh, against Chicago. They haven't played Columbus yet. They're 1-1 one one against Montreal, so they're done with Montreal. So what's interesting is their record against the top teams and the bottom teams is similar. Um, so, so if you want to make the argument that they play down to the teams that are towards the bottom of the standings, that'll make some sense. They haven't beaten Vancouver either. Uh, they haven't beaten Vancouver yet in their history. That's got to be coming, right? They have to beat Vancouver this year because everybody does. Just be a shame if everybody gets invited to the party and they don't. So their power play's been good, a little bit below average at 21.49%. The interesting thing is, all these great numbers and everybody doing well, their penalty kill has not been good. 69.77%. So that is a penalty kill that if that improves in the second half of the season, and I think they've got the penalty killers to get that done, this is a team that could actually get better in the second half of the season. Um, I know there will still be people that say, well, the record's going to get worse because their their, their schedule is going to get tougher. Yeah, uh, it's a really tough road road trip through the eastern uh, area of the, the continent, which, again, a team not too far from me struggles with. And Seattle's making it look like it's no big deal. So I don't know how far this goes. But I know there will still be those that expect them to drop off and end up missing the playoffs. I don't think that ends up happening. I also want to throw in the extras. Morgan Geeky, who's been in and out of the lineup, 31 games, 4 goals, 10 assists, 14 points. Uh, he was, of course, acquired in the expansion draft from Carolina. He's an RFA this summer. The fact that you can rotate him in or out of the lineup shows the depth in this organization. Geeky's playing well, but again, you have too many forwards, so he gets pulled out of the lineup here and there. And Kale Fleury... Uh, acquired from Montreal in expansion draft. Just the six games played, no points. Uh, he's a restricted free agent this summer. It's important to have that depth, and they have it. So this is a Seattle team that's going to be dangerous. Let me know your thoughts in the comments section below, as always. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe if you're browsing your way through. You just happened upon this video. Thank you guys so much for watching, for all your support. I will talk to you again soon.